Today, we rarely use the word servant as it has derogatory overtones and can remind us of things that we would rather not remember from history, such as the class divide and also slavery. Yet, servants played a vital role in society during France's evolution into one of the wealthiest countries in Europe. In this video, we want to share with you what life was like for a poor female servant in the 1800s. This was a typical position that any young woman could find themselves in. After all, domestic housework was much preferable to the other options on the street. Being a female servant in the 19th century required an abundance of energy, self-control and determination. The opening sentence of the Manual Complete de Domestique, Complete Guide for Servants, from 1836, explains, Servants are commonly regarded as an unfortunate necessity. Even the wealthy realised that this was probably not the most esteemed role to play in the household. However, they are considered necessary for daily life in an upper-class property. At this period in history, two categories of servants existed. Both had their own challenges. On one hand, you could be part of a small army taking care of the castles, mansions and bigger houses. This meant working for the same family for many years and therefore you could create a good reputation for yourself. It was common for families of servants to be employed by the same household, so you could have children taking care of the farm work while adults played more prominent roles in the home, such as nursemaid, butler or chauffeur. This lifelong indentured servant was the holy grail of the profession. By building a relationship with the people you served, you were able to prove your worth and may even have been taught skills such as sewing, cooking and accounting, and these would help you move through the ranks. Unfortunately, the second category of servant were those more numerous, more fluid people who would go from home to home hoping to gain a better salary and a more stable existence with each contract that they completed. These migrant workers were often from very poor backgrounds, illiterate and may even have had criminal pasts. It made it hard for them to get a foothold with a family for several reasons. Maybe they were being employed for a specific time period, such as the summer harvest, and would soon be surplus to requirements. Possibly, there would be extra people in the house, visiting relatives for several months. And then, after that, the need would be gone. Whatever the reason for employment, this category of servant faced the added stress of having unstable employment, as well as the gruelling work requirements. Employing a maid or a servant sent the right signal to society. Back then, some of the households even made sacrifices just to hire a servant and be seen as upper class. This could also cause issues for servants who were not known or trusted by the household members. It explains why some ladies of the house kept an excruciatingly close eye on their money or belongings. How easy would it be to blame the stranger in the house for a missing necklace or misplaced silverware. These women were simply keeping up appearances, walking a precarious tightrope of extravagance and debt. Any missing items would easily raise suspicion, even if the servant wasn't to blame. Another blame was also placed on itinerant female workers, and that was infidelity. Members of the household could have their way with a lone young woman knowing that she was either due to move on when the contract ended or that they could have her fired at the drop of a hat. This stereotype has been the subject of many romance novels and period dramas. The lowly servant was stuck at the bottom in the household order. Depending on the skills and competences that they had gained through their experience, they may have been given extra tasks to perform. As mentioned before, this would also rely on trust from either the housekeeper or the head of the family employing them. It's also interesting to note that a servant was usually the closest a rich person ever came to being near a member of the labouring class or peasantry. 
Servants could be used as representatives or go-betweens if certain tasks needed completing. Therefore, the wealthy person could remain at a distance and would not be seen attending a poor part of a city or visiting an unsavoury, dirty place such as an abattoir or a warehouse. Having a servant was a sign of social prestige and proof that you belonged to the ascending bourgeoisie. While in a large house, the tasks could be shared by dozens of servants. In the smaller households, the daily tasks fell on just one or two people who were expected to play all roles perfectly or risk being dismissed. These were often the female servants. According to the research we carried out for case one, we have an idea of a typical day in the life of a female domestic servant at a medium-sized house with just a few employees. Let us imagine it is the end of September and the weather is turning from balmy to brisk. Autumn has set in. You'll be getting up early lighting the morning fires in all the rooms of the house. You must take care not to spill any ashes and not to create smoke that would disturb the master and mistress. Then you'll be preparing the breakfast, cooking eggs, toasting bread, grilling sausages and serving the food in the dining room, taking care to look spotless. Then, after this, you will be carrying freezing cold water from the well or the pump in buckets or metal canisters. You will also need to bring in the wood and the coal from separate stores to the main house. This is dirty, heavy work. Now, you'll be washing the family's clothes by hand, as well as your own, finding somewhere for them to dry in the warm kitchen, but also making sure that they do not end up smelling of cooked food. Thankfully, one of your colleagues is serving lunch, so you can occupy yourself with sweeping and cleaning rooms and, of course, scrubbing the floors, especially since the family dog has tracked mud in from the garden. There will be visitors the next day and you have to prepare the guest rooms with new linens and wash the windows too. There is always something to do and it usually involves physical labour. Moments of rest for you are few and far between. You want to make a good impression on the master and mistress because this is your third house in as many years, but you are exhausted. A household guide of the time even advised that the female servant could use her periods of rest to do sewing for her employers. It is not a surprise then that these women suffered from fatigue, depression and other ailments. The dreaded consumption which we know as tuberculosis, was a common disease. The spread was caused by living in small, unaired dwellings among other infected staff. This could not be avoided because if you didn't work, you didn't get paid. And so often, staff would remain in their roles until the symptoms became noticeable. Working as a domestic servant meant long hours, always being available when the master or mistress of the house needed any help. The servant was the first up in the house and the last to go to bed. Even during sleep, you would be mentally ticking off all the lists of tasks that you had completed and praying that you had not forgotten to prepare your role for the following day. This was more so the case if your reputation had been damaged by gossip or by your own actions, a servant under suspicion would spend their life under the watchful eye of not only their employers, but the other servants too. No matter what their rank, colleagues would be observing behaviour and reporting back to the housekeeper. The issue was, even going outside to do errands was often frowned upon for female servants in the 19th century. We can see this again in the Manual de Domestique. The author despairs of this habit as it suggested that the women use their outside time to meet up and gossip. This can also be seen in today's society 
when people are accused of gossiping like two washerwomen. Female servants are instructed that they need to be clean, washing their hands frequently, ironing their own clothes before going to a church service, and so on. Imagine having no free time, and after cleaning and caring for other people all day, you still have to hold yourself to their high standards just so you can leave the house and create a good reflection on your employer. The work was tiring and unfulfilling. The main hurdle that servants had to cross was that their salaries depended on the revenue of the household they served in. There was no such thing as minimum wage, and there was not a set rate for a certain job position. It depended on the region of France you were in, and also the status of your employer. It's not surprising that workers tended to go where earnings were better, but this also caused an issue for the people coming up below them. In areas where servants were scarce, there would be plenty of work to be filled by even the most incompetent employees. Yet, the household could not afford to pay them more. So these servants, just as Hélène Gagardeau was in case one, would be tasked with catching up from the previous employee's absence and trying to make the best of a bad situation. In general, becoming a servant meant that for a fairly short period, a young girl would leave her family. She would go to work into domestic service and earn a living for herself and her relatives. Importantly, she would get skills that she would need later on as a housewife and mother. Later in life, she would marry, whereby she would cease to work and the husband would be the sole source of income for the household. Unfortunately, this life journey was more often than not unrealized and female servants would remain stuck in a perpetual search for the next best job, desperately trying to avoid unwanted pregnancy, illness and unemployment. <laughs> <laughs> 